Yeah, so 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I wish, uh, starting at verse 7, I wish that all people were as I am. And this is Paul speaking. Uh, but each has his own gift from God. One person has this gift, another has that. I say to the unmarried and to the wi- widows, it is good for them to remain as I am. And then jumping down to verse 17. Let each one live his life in the situation the Lord assigned when God called him. This is what I command in all the churches. Was anyone already circumcised when he was called? He should not undo his circumcision. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? He should not get circumcised. Circumcision does not matter, and uncircumcision does not matter. Keeping God's commands is what matters. Let each of you remain in the situation in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Don't let it be, don't let it concern you. But if you can become free, by all means, take the opportunity. For he who has called by the Lord as a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who is called as a free man is Christ's slave. You are bought at a price. Do not become slaves of people. Brothers and sisters, each person is to remain with God in the situation in which he was called. Now about virgins, I have no command from the Lord, but I do give an opinion as one who by the Lord's mercy is faithful. Because of the present distress, I think it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released. Are you released from a wife? Do not seek a wife. However, if you do get married, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But such people will have trouble in this life, and I am trying to spare you. This is what I mean, brothers and sisters. The time is limited. So from now on, those who have wives should be as though they have none. Those who weep as though they did not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. And those who buy as though they did not own anything. And those who use the world as though they did not make full use of it. For this world in its current form is passing away. I want you to be without concerns. The unmarried man is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But the married man is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife, and his interests are divided. The unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, so that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But the married woman is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. I am saying this for your own benefit, not to put a restraint on you, but to promote what is proper, and so that you may be devoted to the Lord without distraction. Uh, Last week we looked at the topic of marriage, uh, how it was instituted by God uh, from the very beginning of creation. Uh, that marriage was a lifelong commitment between one man and one woman to the exclusion of all others. Uh, That marriage's role was to facilitate the rule and reproducing of image bearers. Uh, Bernard emphasized how marriage was for the service of God and that marriage should not be seen as a way to fulfillment uh, as ultimately our fulfillment can be found in nowhere else but Christ alone. And so while marriage is good, uh, it's not to be idolized to the point where its intended design is a signpost uh, to the greater marriage between God and his people is supplanted. Uh, God's intent for his people is that they imitate their maker and their God, to be holy as he is holy. Uh, God is more concerned with your holiness and your devotion to him than he is about your marital status. Now, can you be pursuing holiness and be God-glorifying in your marriage? Yes, we saw that last week. Now, so where does, that, where does that leave those who aren't married? Can they be God-glorifying in their pursuit of holiness as a single person? Now, the Bible says yes. Now, this morning we're looking at uh, what the Bible says about singleness. 
and why having a biblical understanding is so important. Uh, So often we're comparing the ups of marriage with the downs of singleness. Now, for some, singleness is not something you will have had to have thought about for a long time. Uh, For others, however, it's a constant source of hurt and pain. Uh, Being one body under the Lordship of Christ, it's important to understand singleness because what affects one person will affect another. God's people are described as a body. When one part of the body hurts, it does or should, hurt the rest of the body. Being a family, we need to be looking out for the welfare of other members of the family. Uh, Sam Aubrey, in his book, uh, makes the point that we each have a stake in the health of each other's lives. Uh, And this means that as a married guy, I have a stake in the health of the singles in our family. Uh, Just like a single person has a stake in the health of the married Uh, families in our church. Our role as body members is for caring for and building each other up in the service of God. Uh, Another reason why understanding singleness is important uh, before we move into looking at it uh, is it's important to realize that everyone in God's community will experience singleness at one point or another. Uh, Whether you're young or old, singleness affects us all. Uh, Even those who are married, there's a very real chance that you won't stay that way, uh, either through bereavement or through divorce. Uh, Singleness is not just an early 20s something issue. So it's good to wrestle with this topic as a church, uh, to see what God has to say about it. Uh, So before we get stuck into it, uh, let me pray. Uh, Good and gracious God, Uh, What we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. And what we are not, make us. Uh, In Christ's powerful name. Amen. So what is singleness? Uh, If I was to ask you to finish this sentence, what would you say? Singleness is. I'll give you a second. Have a think. Singleness is. Now, I suspect that the common uh, response would be singleness is not being married or being unmarried, uh, the state of being alone and not being connected to someone else. Uh, While all of these things are true from a certain point of view, Uh, they all paint a pretty negative picture of what singleness is. Uh, Hopefully, uh, there were some positive attributes out there. Uh, Singleness is having flexibility, uh, having freedom. I think an appropriate definition of biblical singleness is a gifted state of life in which a person can wholeheartedly devote themselves to God's work for God's glory. The Bible sees singleness as a gift, something to be treasured. I wonder if we have the same view of singleness. Uh, Now, for the most part, I think there are two different views of singleness. Uh, There's the world's view and there's the biblical view. Uh, The the world view holds uh, singleness in attention. On the one hand, popular culture says it's a bad thing. Uh, It's something to be avoided. Most movies and TV programs usually show main characters either in a relationship or ending up eventually in a relationship. Uh, The implicit message is it's not good to be alone. A classic movie that portrays this is Bridget Jones' Diary, uh, where in uh, one of the scenes at the very beginning of the movie shows Bridget uh, on her lounge Uh, She's just come back from a Christmas dinner where her parents have inevitably tried to set her up with yet another boyfriend. Uh, She's all by herself on the lounge in her sweatpants singing all by myself. 
Now, the alternative worldview uh, and the more tr- recent trend that says that you are enough. You don't need anyone to define you or restrict you. So you are free to do what you want uh, with whomever you want, uh, however you want. YOLO. You only live once. Live your best single life now. So if that's the world view, what is the Christian view? Uh, now, I want to be uh, want to point out that I'm being very specific with my words. When I say Christian, uh, I think there is a difference between mainstream Christian views and that of the Bible. I think the Christian view, for the most part, views singleness still, uh, in part, like the world does. Something to be avoided. Uh, that a mature Christian will find a partner marry, have children, and live happily ever after. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, we make jokes uh, even using acronyms. Uh, So we have just spent four years at Sydney Missionary and Bible College, also known as Single Married Before Christmas. (laughs) We, me and Sinead, uh, did a few years on beach mission, Uh, through Scripture Union. Scripture Union's acronym is S-U-F-M, also known as single until finally married. Now, I can't mock that one too much because I met my wife at a beach mission camp. I think it just goes to show that we kind of make make a joke of it, whether unintentionally or intentionally, uh, but it speaks to the fact that we view singleness as something to transit through. And I know this has been the experience of a number of Christians, uh, Christian friends, who are single. With all good intention, people come up to them and ask uh, at church or at other times and say, have you found a nice guy yet? Have you met a lovely young lady? Now, for one friend in particular, she gets quite annoyed. Uh, Not because she hasn't found anyone, but because people are asking the wrong question. Uh, So often the natural assumption is that if you are single, you must need or be looking for a partner, that you are in some way broken or deficient, incomplete in some way. So the right question my friend wants to hear is, how are you growing in Christ's likeness? Or how are you serving Jesus? Christians, for the most part, have fallen for the same lie as the world, I think. That to be fulfilled means you need to find a partner, start a family. And the Bible says, essentially, that's just rubbish. Uh, What every single person needs is Jesus, more than anything else. Uh, Being single does not mean being incomplete or deficient. And if that's the case, then we follow an incomplete and deficient saviour. And that line of thinking does not go well. So what is biblical singleness if it's not the same as Christian singleness? I think the definition at the start sums it up well. A gifted state of life in which a person can wholeheartedly devote themselves to God's work for his glory. Now, Firstly, biblical singleness. Uh, So uh, for... Five points. Oh, no, sorry, two points. That's my next one. Uh, Firstly, it's not something to be avoided. And this is some of the, uh, how we have misunderstood singleness. Uh, It's not something to be avoided. It's not a transit lounge on the way to something better or the real destination. Uh, I read one secular blogger describe singleness like purgatory. You just have to do your time before you're released. Paul is emphatically clear that that is not the case. And if you want to see what the most fulfilled life looks like, look at Jesus. Now, secondly, if we believe that marriage between a man and a woman is the right and proper place for sexual expression, then it means that to be a Christian single person means to embrace a life of celibacy. 
Now, while it might seem obvious, this is a big distinction between worldly singleness and biblical singleness. Uh, it's incredibly important to stress that, uh, that sexual intimacy is restricted to biblical marriage. Now, that's not to say that there is no intimacy for single people. Uh, on the contrary, singleness may allow for more deeper and intimate relationships, just not of a sexual nature. And it was wonderful hearing from Patricia yesterday talk about that. And so it's helpful to think about this and helpful when thinking through same-sex attraction. Uh, Sam Albury, uh, so in this book and in many other uh, spaces, has written and spoken into this area. So Sam, as I mentioned earlier, is a same-sex attracted uh, Christian guy, uh, yet has chosen a life of singleness and celibacy, trusting in God's goodness for his life, rather than hearing the world's loud call to embrace one's true identity. His identity is hidden in Christ. And so how does the Bible correct these misunderstandings? Uh, the Bible is very clear that when it comes to singleness, it's a good and godly path to take. Paul goes as far to say that he wishes that all people would be like him, single for the gospel, being undistracted by the concerns of this world. Now, the Bible helps us realign our understanding of singleness from a mostly negative state and something to be avoided uh, to a very positive state and something to be affirmed. And it does this in five ways. Uh, firstly, it's a gift. Uh, secondly, there are rich blessings. Thirdly, it enables great commitment to Jesus. Uh, fourthly, it deepens our understanding of what the church family is. Uh, and fifth, uh, it displays the beauty of the gospel. Uh, so firstly, if nothing else, Paul very much affirms the Christian single life. Uh, it's a good thing, something to be treasured. Paul reiterates his point on a number of occasions, and we read in verse uh, 7 and 8 of 1 uh, Corinthians. Effectively, his desire is that believers concern themselves more, le uh, concern themselves less with changing their situation in which they find themselves, be that married or single, slave or free, circumcised or uncircumcised, and be more concerned, as verse 19 says, with keeping God's commands, now, this is what matters, Paul says. So whatever situation you find yourselves in, when you come to Christ, he encourages you to stay that way. Be content with the stage of life you find yourself in. Now, for those who grew up in the church, believe in Christ as their Lord and Saviour, that may possibly mean being single. Singleness is a gift, from God, just as marriage is a gift from God. Both are given by God for God's use. Now, the point becomes clearer later in chapter 7. Uh, now, second point, uh, there are rich blessings in singleness. Now, it may seem contrary, uh, but to be willing to choose to go without marriage will bring blessing, God says. As we heard in Isaiah 56, uh, the eunuch who holds fast to the covenant uh, for God and seeks the things that please him will receive an everlasting name, never to be cut off, uh, an inheritance better than physical descendants. Likewise, Jesus commends those who make themselves eunuchs for the gospel in Matthew 19 and promises in Mark chapter 10, that those who give up houses or brothers, sisters or fathers, mothers or children, fields, because of the name of Jesus and his gospel, will receive a hundred times more houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, children and fields with persecution and eternal life. There is a rich blessing for those who deny themselves for the sake of the gospel. Now, Paul is very clear in 1 Corinthians 7 uh, that as a single person, you have more X, Y's and Z's to spend on the concerns of the Lord 
rather than worrying about a spouse or a family. He says, though, that if you are married, it's not a sin. <laughs> Oof, good. <sighs> Wonderful. But you will have troubles in this life. Paul is being real. Uh, now, as a single bloke, I moved around a lot in my 20s. Uh, everything I owned fit into my little Corolla. Um, to be fair, I love playing Tetris, so it's kind of a bit of a game. Um, but it's not that simple now, being married. I can't just up and go to this place or the other. I can't spend my money however I choose. Uh, heck, even getting out the door in the mornings can be tricky. Uh, it really struck me and Sinead uh, earlier this week, just the stark difference between uh, being single and uh, having a family. Uh, we went camping with Sinead's brother. Uh, it took us so long, an awful amount of time, to pack up all of our stuff, all the rigmarole that goes with camping. Um, all the while, Sinead's brother had one bag with everything in it, uh, and he sat back and wondered why it took us so long to get ready. I think he's got something you know, coming for him when, when he realizes. Now, these are good and fun things, and I wouldn't trade them for the world, but being married uh, has limits on our ability to serve God in certain ways, uh, just by the mere practicalities. Paul's not wanting to discredit marriage. Now, far from it, he holds marriage in a very high light. But he is wanting believers to be aware of the realities of marriage, and the benefits of remaining single. As a single person, you can turn on a dime to care for members of the church. You're less restricted uh, in how and when you serve, and to be more flexible and responsive than that of marrieds within the church. Now, of course, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, so it's important to note that Paul isn't envisaging freedom uh, that's going to be used for selfish gain or life without commitments. I know the freedom that comes from being single aids in the undivided life in the service of Christ. Uh, Paul writes these words of encouragement uh, in 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, in verse 35 we see that these are for benefiting his readers so that you may devote, be devoted to the Lord without distraction. Now, uh, this is the gift of the single life. Now, uh, fourthly, it deepens our understanding of God's family. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, God's church is often described as a family. And so where does a single person fit into God's family? Uh, often singleness is described in the negative, uh, without, lacking something. Uh, and I think that c couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, yes, as a single person, you may not be in a married relationship, but the depth and breadth of relationships within God's family is staggering. To be in Christ automatically means adoption into a more permanent family than any worldly family. Uh, earthly families, as good as they are, are temporary, whereas God's family is eternal you are clo more closely linked to a brother or sister in Christ than to other family members. Now, it's wonderful when family members are brothers and sisters in Christ, but that's not always the case. Now, Jesus makes it very clear in Matthew 22, uh, talking about uh, marriage in the coming age. Uh, marriage is temporary. Uh, Paul, um, in Colossian, in Corinthians, he's addressing not just the singles in this passage and not just marrieds in the previous passage, but, uh, but all as brothers and sisters in the faith. Uh, so what of children? Does the single person miss out? Again, the Bible says no. Again, Paul is wanting... Uh, Oh, in, the, in Corinthians, Paul is wanting to shift the perspective uh, of his readers. Uh, and we need to shift our perspective from the physical and temporary 
to the spiritual and eternal. Now, Paul, a single bloke, describes himself as a father to the Corinthian church in chapters 4, verse 15. He goes on to describe Timothy as a dearly loved and faithful child in the Lord. He counts Rufus's mother as his own mother in Romans 16. Now, Paul uses uh, feminine language to describe his motherly care of the Thessalonian church. And the Apostle John uses parental language addressing his readers as my little children. A single person can still fulfill the creational mandate we heard from last week. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. How can a single person do this? Jesus makes it very clear that membership in the kingdom comes through regeneration, not procreation. A person gifted with singleness fulfills the mandate not by producing physical offspring, but rather by listening to Christ's command and obeying. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Go and make children of God, regenerated image bearers of the King. And finally, fifthly, singleness displays the beauty of the gospel. A misunderstanding singleness reflects the way that we've probably that we're probably looking uh, at marriage in unbiblical and unhealthy ways. Now, marriage is not the ultimate goal, nor our ultimate fulfilment. Now, Sam Aubrey sums up singleness, how singleness displays the beauty of the gospel like this. And he says, both marriage and singleness testify to the gospel. Marriage shows us the shape of the gospel in that it models the covenant promises that God has made to us in Christ. Singleness shows us the sufficiency of the gospel because it shows us the reality to which marriage points to, which is our own relationship with Jesus. Now, this is the real marriage. This is the ultimate goal for us all. Singleness is a way of saying that because I've got the reality, I don't need the signpost. I don't need the model of it. And so when, so if we, so if we were not honoring singleness rightly, it means we're not by the same token honoring marriage rightly or the ultimate marriage that both of them are meant to point to. To a watching world, biblical singleness can be a powerful expression of faith. It says God is enough. God is sufficient. God is better than anything or anyone else. God is worth all the pain of following him. Uh, So how do we walk, I think this is the last point on your outline, how do we walk with a person gifted with singleness in our church? What does all this mean for us when we start our week tomorrow? How can we walk with people who are gifted with singleness in our church? Uh, Firstly, if needs be, we need to be repentant. And we can't just dismiss the fact that we may be viewing singleness in an unbiblical way. That That our view of singleness is more shaped by culture around us than what the Bible says. So I encourage you to take some time this week uh, to think through how you view singleness, how you talk about it, uh, the way you talk with single people, uh, even the way that as parents we pray for our children. Do you pray for a future spouse that they'll meet that special someone? Or do you pray that they will come to know Jesus as Lord and Saviour, that they will grow up in the fear of the Lord, willing to serve Him however He chooses? Now, secondly, be praying for those who are single, that they would be growing in holiness and glorifying God through their gift. Now, pray that they would be seeking first God's kingdom rather than their own concerns or worldly desires. And thirdly, we need to be a family that shows hospitality. If you are married, include singles, single people. Have them round for a meal. Invite them over for a games night. 
or when you go out. Single people, uh, don't be afraid to have families over for a meal. Yes, we're loud. Yes, we're often messy. Um, but it will benefit us both. Uh, if you're going out into the community to do something, invite a family along. Uh, everyone has a stake in the health of the body of Christ. Now, some of our richest moments at college was getting to know and love the single people on campus, uh, to share meals with them, playing games with them, uh, even enduring lockdowns and having them stay with us, and to see many of them using their gifts as however the Lord would will for their lives. Uh, singleness is not something to be wished away, lamented of, or used for selfish gain. Uh, to finish, uh, John Piper f- summarizes singleness this way. God promises spectacular blessings to those of you who remain single in Christ. He gives you an extraordinary calling for your life. To be single in Christ is therefore not a falling short of God's best, but a path of Christ-exalting, covenant-keeping obedience that many are called to walk. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Uh, Thank you that uh, in it is life uh, and that you speak to us through it. Uh, Thank you uh, yeah, that singleness is a blessing, uh, just as marriage is a blessing. I pray that we uh, see that and change our views uh, to be more uh, gospel-centered and more biblical. I pray that we would be a community that uh, embraces uh, single people, whether young or old, uh, not yet married, uh, those who are widowed or divorced, I pray that we would be a beacon uh, to the community that says uh, that this community uh, is for you and that we are covenant-keeping people. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Now, it's my first time, so I'm going to open up to questions. Be gentle. If you have any, shoot. If not, catch me afterwards. And if it's too hard, I'll get Bernard to answer. <laughs> Back stuff. <laughs> yes. So uh, the question was, as a single person, should you be content with your singleness or keeping an eye out for someone? Is that right? Um, That's a great question. Uh, Look, how about I just um, go with verse 17? Uh, (laughs) uh, Let us live out our lives in the situation the Lord... Uh, assigned when God called him. Can I leave it at that? Uh, look, uh, singleness is described as a gift, uh, just as marriage is described as a gift. Um, Jesus says, you know, for those who can hear it or understand it, uh, it's a good path to take. Does that mean everyone should remain single? Maybe not. Uh, but likewise, does that mean that everyone should get married? No. Uh, so I think uh, using your gift of singleness um, in part is just using it as you are. So as if in, if you're single now, uh, don't see it as something to be uh, something to lose or to you know, go to Bible college so you're single and married before Christmas. Um, Use your gift how 
God has given it to you now. So that means if you are single, use it to its fullest. Uh, if by chance God brings a partner into your life and you do marry, uh, then you shift from using a single gift, the gift of singleness, to using a, the gift of marriage. Uh, there are things that we are doing in our marriage that I don't think we could do as a single person. Um, like being at a playground with a whole bunch of kids, it might look a little bit weird if you're a single person just sitting there. Um, you can do that as a parent. You've got kids interacting with other kids. Um, school is a great place uh, to be a gospel witness. Uh, and that wouldn't happen if you didn't have kids and uh, if you weren't in a family. 